I think my portfolio or extracurricular activities were like the stronger side of my application. Um, so I, I would definitely say there's this impression that you, everyone needs to be extremely spiked uh, in one area that is like, that means, I don't know, being the best in the world in math or something. Um, I think I was more well-rounded than spiked. So both can work. Um, I had both a mixture of humanities and the sciences, and perhaps that was what I brought fresh to the table. So for instance, in, in the humanities, uh, I did a lot of debating in high school. Um, so for instance, I went to world schools debate championships four times. Um, twice from Bangladesh and twice from Wales, uh, where my high school was. And so that experience in national team like helped me learn a lot about politics and sociology and humanities. Hi everyone. For those new to my channel, I'm Siam Shoy Noor, a Bangladeshi rising senior at Harvard University. This is a playlist where I interview successful applicants going to top universities. There has been a lot of requests for this playlist and I finally gave in. If you want to follow this playlist based on the interviews you want to watch, please subscribe below. You got to help us win over the YouTube algorithm. If you don't, then you won't get the notifications when new interviews that you want come in. So please subscribe, thumbs up this video. You know what to do, you know the routine. Today, I have an amazing guest. He's none other than Sheikh Srijan from Stanford's class of 2022. Srijan, why don't you introduce yourself? First, Siam, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to come to your show. I'm a big fan of your work. Um, so I'm Sheikh Srijan. Um, I go by Srijan usually. I went to school in Dhaka in St. Joseph's. And then I went to United World Colleges for my IB, which is almost the same at um, HSC or A-levels. And then currently I'm a rising senior, rising junior at Stanford um, in California. Thank you for the introduction. Srijan is an amazing person. You will get to know all about his story as you watch the interview. In this interview, like usual, and the other college playlist videos, we'll be talking about standardized exams, academic results, ECAs, essays, recommendation letters, and finally, overall final advice. So let's start with standardized exams. Srijan, what standardized exams did you give? How did you score in each of them? And finally, how did you, how do you think they contributed to your application? Yeah, so they are obviously an important part of the process, but they are not the entire story. I think they are just a data point to, for the applicant to get through the initial screening. So I gave the SAT and um, I gave it two times, I think, and my com composite score was in the bulk park of 1470 to 1480. So I, I think it was 790 math and 680 uh, reading and writing, but I, I might be slightly off, plus minus 10. I also gave subject tests. I gave uh, math and physics and my scores were in the ballpark of 750 for both. Um, I did not give the IELTS or IELTS. Um, and basically I went to an English version school in St. Joseph in Bangladesh. And I also did the IB in the UK, um, as I mentioned. And then ba based on that, I emailed a bunch of admissions officers that I think this exam would be unnecessary, uh, given that I went to English speaking schools from the very start. And all colleges except Amherst was quite willing to accept, uh, to quite, quite willing to give me a waiver. Um, so I just said, okay, Amherst, bye bye. <laughs> Um, I remember when I was uh, applying, I did not apply to Cornell because their financial aid deadline ended uh, on December and I did not have the time. So I was like, you know what, I'll just not apply to Cornell. Uh, and I'm, <laughs> I'm glad to see you did not apply to Elmhurst because of uh, the waivers. For those watching, if you're coming from an English version school or English medium school, know that you can get the TOEFL or IELTS waived in many universities. Universities usually say that if your primary uh, language of instruction in your school was English, you can get these requirements out of the way so you don't have to spend precious money uh, giving this English proficiency exams. Thank you for sharing your scores. Let's move on to the next section, which is academic results. Can you talk about the institutions where you got your high school degrees from, your grades, and finally, how that helped in your application? Yeah, I think my uh, grades were a more representative data point for my life. So from I had two, two transcripts from St. Joseph's, one, one for grade nine and the SSC for grade uh, 10. So for nine, grade nine, I had like all letter, letter grades. I think I had B's and C's as well. 
Um, St. Joseph has a policy of grade deflation in general, like, um, like many other uh, national curriculum schools. Um, so my principal gave a clarification letter about like the statistics and the grade deflation that you generally see in, in, in our school. And I think that helped to put things in, into perspective for uh, foreign admissions officers. Uh, for SSE, I had all A pluses. And um, then I did the IB, the International Baccalaureate in United World College in the UK. Uh, in that I was, I applied with a predicted of 44 out of 45. It has a slightly different and strange scale. Um, basically it, it's scaled out of seven, there are six subjects, so that's 42 and three points for extracurricular. So I had a 44 predicted. And I think eventually on the IB, I got like somewhat of a 41. Uh, thank you for sharing your scores. You were talking about United World College uh, and could you speak a bit more about how one can go to United World College from Bangladesh? Yeah, so I think it's one of the few opportunities there are uh, in the world for high school students. So I got a full scholarship to United World College as well. It's it's basically a high school in the UK um, and in 17 other countries in the world. It's a chain of international high schools. And um, it was formed uh, at the height of the Cold War by this German philosopher called Kurt Hahn, who wanted to bring young people and potential future leaders into a closed campus and make them interact with each other so you can learn about each other's cultures. I think in a world of polarization, this is very, um, this is a very important reminder, like the fact that we need to, you know, respect each other's diversity. And every, like the Cold War went away, but the concept of the college stayed. And the United World Colleges gave a lot of scholarships to children all around the world. There's a national committee in Bangladesh. Anyone can know about this if they go to www.uwcbd.org. Um, and there's a yearly application and you can apply. There's some scholarships, there's some full scholarships as well, one of which I avail. Oh, which grade do you, is it at the end of grade 10? When did you apply? Yeah, you typically apply, um, like, if you're doing the SSC curriculum, it will be like in December of your 10th grade, you apply and then, um, then you give the SSC and then three, four months later, you can go away. Uh, and this, uh, this, like, colleges across the world, you can all, almost come from any other country as well. It's not an opportunity just for Bangladeshi students. You can come from India, Pakistan, you name it. Yeah, the, it's, the, the structure has a lot of like, it, it sort of mandates diversity. So my school had 95 nationalities in a student body of 200. So all of my roommates were from different countries. I, one of them was Norwegian, one from Paraguay, another from Italy. So oh, wow. like, it's, it's, less likely that you'll bump into someone from your own country than otherwise. <laughs> That's a crazy experience. Okay, thank you for sharing that. Let's move on to the next section of our interview, which is extracurricular activities. Srijan, could you speak about which were your major extracurricular activities, your biggest achievement in each type, and finally, stories or advice that you have regarding any of those? Yeah, so um, I, I, I think my portfolio or extracurricular activities were like the stronger side of my application. Um, so I, I would definitely say there's this impression that you, everyone needs to be extremely spiked uh, in one area that is like, that means, I don't know, being the best in the world in math or something. Um, I think I was more well-rounded than spiked. So both can work. Um, I had both a mixture of humanities and the sciences, and perhaps that was what I brought fresh to the table. So for instance, in, in the humanities, uh, I did a lot of debating in high school. Um, so, for instance, I went to World Schools Debate Championships four times, um, twice from Bangladesh and twice from Wales, uh, where my high school was. And so that experience in national team like helped me learn a lot about politics and sociology and humanities, etc. Um, so, and this is, I, I think, slightly important because a lot of people have this perception that debaters now make it to great schools, but like it was not a trend a few years ago. So there's no feeder activity. There's no like one extracurricular that takes you to places, right? Like you do what you mm -hmm. like and eventually a story sort of carves out of, of your life. Um, secondly, I did some science competitions as well, um, or as I like to call them, baby research. Um, so for instance, I did a water science project with a few friends from St. Joseph's, Labib and Navid. Um, we designed an urban micro plan that recycles 45% of gray water. That is water that's used in like uh, flushing, in like uh, when you shower, when you wash things, and that constitutes a majority of water usage. We also uh, integrated the system with like a rainwater harvesting that was a bit no more novel than what you see in the market. And then we pitched this idea to two science competitions where we got recognitions. One was um, the Stockholm Junior Water Prize. There's a Bangladesh national round. 
And we won that. Then we got mentorship from a few professors at Buet. Um, and then we went to the international round as finalists uh, with 28 other countries. And then another, then we worked on the same project a bit more and collaborated with another project uh, from Canada. And um, we got to the semifinals of MIT Water Innovation Award in 2017. And that was a graduate level competition. So I think these two like uh, research-based activities and, and my debating as well, both sort of helped me come across as a more well-rounded person. Okay, uh, so one major t- takeaway I'm getting from this is that you don't necessarily have to have a spike. For those who doesn't know, don't know what spike means, it means having an extraordinary level of accomplishment in one side of extracurricular activities. It could be you're a math genius or you could be your national level basketball player or something. However, in both Srijan and my case, actually, we were coming from a more well-rounded applicant pool rather than a spike carrying pool. And I think it worked out well for us. So there is a good chance it can work out well for you too. Thank you for sharing your extracurricular activities. Let's move on to our next section, which is essays. What were your common app slash Stanford essays about? What did you focus on? Any advice in that area? Yeah, the essay is probably the most important part of the application, in my opinion, especially for international, because everyone is a very good candidate and the probabilities are stacked against us. So you really have to like set yourself apart in the essay. Um, so my common app essay was in terms of themes, uh, I, I would say they were themed around resilience and calmness at crisis. So like without getting too much into details, um, I had a lot of health issues growing up, especially in ninth and 10th grade. I was quite sick throughout that period. A lot of hospitalizations, a lot of other problems. And uh, I could not even go to school for seven months in my 10th grade. Oh, wow. so I not, yeah, I could not go to a single class. It was quite bad. Um, but I was very stubborn uh, in giving the SSC. So basically on self-preparation. And uh, I think that period, those seven to eight months taught me a lot about um, managing your emotions, also like crisis and failure in general, because like the first few weeks and the first few months were all failure, right? I still remember, I think I finished uh, my SSC syllabus for the first time, like a week uh, before the exam. So did not give a single model test, no Udpash, no other coaching, um, all self-studying. So that was quite difficult. So I think my college application, I said, was about that period. And so so I, I think I sort of connected to that, how that those like seven, eight months formed me as a person and how those will help me project what I want my future to be like. Um, so sort of like, I don't know, light at the end of a dark tunnel sort of vibe. Mm-hmm. Um, also in terms of the co- college supplement, Stanford's college supplements uh, is, is, are, are like slightly different. Um, yeah, you probably I, know. I remember, yeah. yeah. So most colleges have a long supplement, like 700 words. Stanford has 11 short questions. And they're very like Stanford questions. They're very much like, what is one biggest problem in the world? Uh, what, what is one thing about you that no, no one else has? Like, I, I don't specifically remember a lot of those, but I do remember that I wrote about um, the biggest problem in humanity I see now is, is inaction. So right. it's staying silent at injustice and also not contributing positively when you can. Mm-hmm. Um, and some variants of that and for what like i think another question was what inspires you like what wakes you up in the day and i I think i wrote something around like you know innovation and something around the claim that human life has no intrinsic value um sounds slightly nihilistic like one individual life does not matter much in the grand scheme of things but when you combine a lot of lives and when you combine like what unity can do to human civilization as a whole, that is quite inspiring. So I want to work in groups to like sort of pass the baton forward to the next person in the in the race. Um, I, th- I think that was something around like what sort of gets me up in the morning. Oh, wow. Uh, so our boy Srijan here could not go to school for seven months and yet he managed to get back up and fight his way to all these extracurricular activities and academics. So you can really see how much resilience he could have uh, shown on his essays. He's also a part-time philosopher, it seems, uh, talking about a lot of these things in Stanford's many questions. I remember that is the exact reason why I didn't apply to Stanford. 
because I had like big essays that I kind of modified to fit different college supplements. And I couldn't do the same for Stanford because there were short questions. And I was like, hey, I don't have time. I have to study for national medical exams. I have to study for my IBA preparation. I'm like, you know what? I won't apply to Stanford. It's fine. They have a low acceptance rate anyway. So, <laughs> so does Harvard. So does Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> but they have a large supplement. So I was like, you know, why not? So moving on from essays to recommendation letters, who wrote your recommendation letters and why did you choose them? Yeah. So um, I, I have two recommendation letters from my teachers. And I think I had two from like outside of my school. Um, so, and that's interesting because I think like they only allow two on the common app, if I'm not wrong. And some schools allow two on the common app and one external. So uh, the, the fourth one I emailed, uh, the, I, I asked my recommenders to email directly to the school using my common app ID. So I just wanted to drop that as a pointer that, you know, nothing's ne- like nothing set in stone in this world. There's a negotiation for everything. If yeah. you want like a fourth recommendation letter that adds value to your application, go for it. Send them an email. They'll, they'll probably read, a, read it. Um, so my first uh, school recommendation was from my physics teacher in United World College, uh, where I did my high school. And um, I think the, he did sit with me for an hour about what, like he, what, what would be good points to write about in the recommendation because your teachers don't really know you personally that much. So that meeting helped a lot to clarify things. Um, and I think he probably wrote about improvement and grit because I remember not doing very well in my exams when I just came to United World College. It was a different curriculum, you know, like SSC is not very analytical, like it's yeah. a bit more rote. So when I did the IB, it was like a whole new world. So I did quite poorly in my first term, did not get like that good grades. So I think he wrote about like improvement in the process. Um, and secondly, my second recommendation letter was from my, uh, he was the moderator of the debate club in, in St. Joseph. And I think he focused more on like my leadership side of things that how I like help St. Joseph's to like um, tournaments, to, to, to doing well in tournaments in the country. And the two other recommendation letters that I gave that were from outside the school. They were f- from my research supervisors. So one uh, person's, uh, uh, Tanvir Sir, he is an, I think he's an associate professor now in Buet, um, in, in civil engineering. Uh, he mentored me in my water science research. And uh, so he gave one. And another one like uh, g- came from someone quite famous, uh, Shamir Montazid, when he was working at Oxford, um, uh, because I interned at his lab as well uh for uh it, it was basically a crispr lab and i did a wet lab re- research internships in re- internship in my final year of school i actually have a funny story about that internship like super funny anecdote so i basically wanted to work at this uh lab for quite a while and then surprisingly i found out that he works like in the periphery so when I emailed them with like my resume and said that, hey, I'm really interested. I know nothing, but I really want to learn. I'll do it for free. You don't have to pay me or anything. I just want to learn. They gave me a time that clashed with my uh, UWC mock exams for the IB. So two months before the IB exam. So the, the mock exams were set and I got the opportunity to do an internship for three weeks during that period. So obviously my school wouldn't let me go right at all. Yeah. So basically I told my teacher that there's a family emergency. I really have to go. And I skipped through my mock exams and then did that internship. My school still does not know about it. I hope they don't find out here. Um, but yeah, that, that was that was fun. So my streak of not giving mock exams before finals co- continues <laughs> right throughout high school. Um, I think I really liked one thing about how Sri John basically just approached the process is that this mentality that nothing is set in stone. So a lot of the times I have people coming up to me saying that, hey, our school does not have XYZ transcript and uh, Stanford requires XYZ transcript, what do I do? Or I have four recommendation letters, which are actually very important and tells a lot about me, but they have only space to submit three. You can always find, almost always find a way around it. You can email them. Once you submit your application, you'll be given access to application portals where you can upload your recommendation letters. I remember, uh, I also had a fourth recommendation letter from uh, based on this internship I did from a, for an Alzheimer's organization. And I remember just uploading it in my applicant portal once the applications have been submitted. 
So never take these things for sto uh, set in stone. Uh, sometimes you have to make trade-offs as well, as you can see, so you don't have mock exams, which are very important. And then he had this amazing opportunity to intern in a CRISPR lab. And then he chose CRISPR lab and he prioritized that. So sometimes you have to make these trade-offs and really no one can give you uh, the guideline of what you must do. It's really up to you and how you prioritize. Even if he didn't do that internship and if he, even if he went for the mock test, he still might have got into Stanford, but that is a choice he made and it worked out well for him. So the two like recurring themes, one is like rules aren't set in stone. You can find a work way around it and you have to learn how to prioritize your application for yourself. Hi, thanks for watching this. I really hope this was helpful. I wanted to inform people of an exciting education startup called Titans Education that I'm co-founding. Our mission is to help people apply to top US universities. Through us, you'll be able to work with a staff of people already studying in places like Oxford, Harvard, Princeton, Stanford, and many more. If you want to know more about us, visit our Facebook page called Titans Education or our website www.titanseducation.com. Thank you. So thank you so much. Let's move on to the final segment of our interview, which is overall final advice. So if you were to apply again, what would you do differently? And finally, now that you look back, what, uh, what are some best advice for students who are just looking to apply to some, a place as competitive as Stanford? Ooh, very difficult questions. Um, <laughs> so what I would do differently, I it would definitely start early. Like I can't stress this enough. How this is the imp fourth person, you're the fourth person in a row who gave the same advice. Cliches are true. Cliches yeah. are true. <laughs> so I started really late. Um, it was all like one after another, like one exam after another. That's not ideal. If you can give your first SAT like um, at least one year before you actually want to submit it. So the December before you want to apply, um, that would be a good target. Uh, and even if you don't have preparation, just just do it, you know, just to get a flavor of it. Or even give a mock exam if you don't want to sit for the real one because it's expensive. Um, secondly, um, so a lot of people ask like, oh, you know, can I do X, can I do Y to get into Harvard, to get into Princeton? Um, the way I like to think about it is that, yeah, US university application is not a job interview. It's not a job application where you have to fit check boxes. It's like an auction. It's an IPL auction. It's basically you, Sakibala san, coming and saying, you know, this is what I bring to the table. This is my economy rate. This is my batting stats. This is who I am. Which one of you want to take me in your team? And I think that approach is really fresh. That's basically the fit we keep talking about in universities. Um, so basically, you should really try to be original, right? You should just try to do things that you enjoy and then be very honest about it and then ask these universities, um, which of you would like to have me, right? I mean, I don't think there's any point in being fake in the world about anything, like yeah. not even Harvard, not even Stafford. Yeah. So that would be my advice for others, I guess. And I probably, maybe I have a few other advices as well. So the first one was originality, very important. Um, not doing things as check boxes. Um, thirdly, I would say like, and people underappreciated this, this, this a bit, um, is to be memorable. And it's really like leave an impact. And some frameworks that helped me was that I really tried to make my application, like I, I wanted anyone to read my application and be able to summarize me in one sentence. Um, and for me, that sentence was this, is a crazy kid who takes outrageous risks when the odds are against him. So I'm completely fine with failing and I failed a lot in many things. So I think that was my brand to the universities. Um, so being memorable is really important and, uh, and, and like sort of the taking away aspects that do not contribute to that one frame. So I, I took a lot of things out of my application because at times I felt like it's not adding to a coherent story, um, wow. sort of like building onto the story that so, you want to portray. Yeah, so those are great advice. Uh, to recap, number one, start early. That is something a lot of uh, interviews are coming on and saying start early. It will give you a lot of time to uh, basically reevaluate yourself, give exams a second time, uh, prepare yourself better. Number two, be authentic. It's really about what you bring to the table and how unique you are and what 
kind of new perspective you can bring to a college class body. And the more uh, authentic and unique you are, the better your chances of getting in. And finally, um, premium advice right here is that be memorable. I think a lot of the times candidates write in great things, but they sort of don't really leave a brand so that the admission officers, after reading thousands of essays, can really close their eyes and think about, okay, I remember this one person who can be defined in one line, and I think this person should get in. Uh, a lot of the times the people have tons of extracurricular activities and tons of anecdotes about themselves, and, it's, and they try to put it all in. However, I think it is important to realize that you have a singular brand and you must try to form, uh, in our opinions, I, I share this opinion as well, a coherent brand across and just leave out details that do not contribute to that brand. So those were the three advice from Srijan. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope this helps a lot of applicants out there. For anyone watching this, I know after this interview, you will get lots of comments such as make an interview about Stanford PhD, make an interview about Oxford, make an interview about MIT. And as my like, as long as my time permits, I will try to do all of those. However, you won't know when I made those videos if you don't subscribe to this channel right now. Subscribe below, help us beat the YouTube algorithm, and then we can give you the videos you want. If you ever see Srijan on the streets and if you found his opinions, advice, or experience helpful, please thank him. It's always, it's always a good habit to practice gratitude. Thank you so much for being here, Srijan, once again. Hope you enjoyed yourself.